Welcome to the first episode of Paradigm Sherpas. I'm your host, Ryan Donnelly, and today I'm very excited to be introducing Dr. Christian De Quincey. Dr. De Quincey is a professor of consciousness studies and philosophy. He's also an author. Some of his works include Radical Nature, Radical Knowing, Understanding Consciousness Through Relationship, and Deep Spirit, Cracking the Noetic Code. He's here today to talk to us about paradigms and paradigms of consciousness. There are many definitions of paradigms, but the simple definition is that they are a collection of beliefs that join together to shape our understanding of reality. Paradigms are often subconscious, and even if we are conscious of them, we take for granted that they're based in truth. Paradigms are often inherited from society, family, religion, and other external sources. They are not founded in some universal truth. They are stories that are generally agreed upon by a group of people, at least for a certain period of time. Paradigms place limits on what we think is possible. When enough anomalies or events take place that contradict a given paradigm, we as a society or as individuals may toss out that paradigm for something new. This transformation or jump to something new is called a paradigm shift. And with that, it gives me great pleasure to introduce our first paradigm Sherpa, Dr. Christian okay, De Quincey. Well, good. Um, and by the way, thank you for that introduction. Very much appreciated. Yeah. Um, I think the simplest way to understand a paradigm is a, it's a technical word um, that really gained popularity in the writings of the philosopher of science, Thomas Kuhn, um, who basically pointed out that um, science operates according to different paradigms, which if you like are belief systems and assumptions and values. And that over the years, there will be a paradigm shift. And that's what he calls that revolutionary science. While we're stuck in a paradigm, he calls that normal science. And normal science just goes along without questioning its basic assumptions, just accepts that's the way things are. And then gradually, either some scientists in their research or even individuals just going about their lives will have experiences that don't fit into that paradigm. They are what are technically called, technically called anomalies. They don't fit the paradigm. Well, occasionally, you know, these things happen and the scientific community will say, okay, but we, okay, there's something there that we will investigate. And then another anomaly will happen, then another anomaly, and, then another, and eventually they begin to accumulate so much so that the weight of the anomalies crashes the normal paradigm and it has to break through to a new belief system because it can no longer resist the contradictions that people are reporting in, from their own direct experiences. And so the, the theories, the belief systems have to change to accommodate these new experiences. And so that's a shift from normal science, which is probably 90% of what science is doing most of the time. And then occasionally there will be these paradigm shifts like from shifting from Newtonian mechanism to quantum physics is an example of that. Um, um, a typical cultural paradigm is often cited is the, um, well, two that are frequently cited is the collapse of the Berlin Wall, that up until days before it happened, nobody ever expected that to happen. The belief system was it's there to stay, but the anomalies, the, the shifts were happening that eventually it just collapsed and it broke down. And then the other paradigm was when John F. Kennedy announced that um, America would land a man on the moon by the end of that decade in the 1960s. And, and then it happened. And of course, everything shifted as a result of that. <clears throat> so those are examples of paradigms and paradigm shifts. So a paradigm essentially is a, a set of beliefs, a belief system with values and assumptions and ways of behaving and acting in the world. And we all live in these paradigms. And most of the time, it's like a fish in the ocean. We are, no, we are unaware of the fact that we are swimming in these belief systems, swimming in these paradigms. We just take that to be the way things are until something 
doesn't fit any longer. And then we have to shift and pay, you know, look at it from a different angle. And then that begins the process, at least the opening for a paradigm shift. I love what you said about the fish in the water, right? Like, I, I, you know, I grew up, um, here's an example. Uh, when I moved, my, my parents said, hey, we're, we're moving from Cleveland to Denver when I was 12. And I thought the world was over. I thought, you know, Cleveland, Ohio was the greatest place. Like there was no good thing outside of it. And then I moved and I met all these good people. And sure, I miss the old place, but I, I couldn't even fathom that there was a a, a good place on earth or in my country that would be a safe, fun, nurturing environment for me to live. And like, now, since then, I've had a billion paradigms blown. But, you know, the point being is like, it's an unraveling of the onion. Once you start to realize you are this fish in the ocean of paradigms, and then you start to can maybe recognize them outside and inside a lot more and more, I guess. Yeah. Well, and, sorry, go ahead. No, I, that, I was just, uh, I guess that was the close of the thought. Um, and, you know, I think we'll talk about a little bit coming up here about, you know, ways to know those internal paradigms better um, through, you know, some of the, you know, the techniques that you, you're familiar with and leverage. But, um, you know, can you talk to me about like, why you think it's so difficult for us as individuals and a collective to create, you know, I guess, accumulate the anomalies, as you said, to break through paradigms. Like, I, you know, for me, it's, it's hard to change uh, my behaviors or perspectives. And, you know, I think it's even more harder sometimes for society. Yeah. Okay. Well, that relates to another aspect of the question you posed initially, which is what I wanted to get to next as well, which is why are paradigms important? Why should we care about them? Why pay, why pay attention to them? Well, first thing I should also emphasize is that paradigms are cultural beliefs. They are collective beliefs. And when people talk about personal paradigms, that's technically a misuse of the term paradigm because it's a cultural belief. Now, of course, every, every one of us has our own belief system and sets of assumptions that we have inherited from the larger surrounding cultural paradigms. So in a sense, we are, we are an avenue or an expression for the cultural paradigm. But because it's a cultural paradigm, a collective phenomenon, it's not something that we can individually choose to change. And I think that's a misconception that um, is quite widespread. Um, let me just turn off my, my mail app. Um, I, I sense that people think that, you know, there's some action we can take to accelerate the paradigm shift. I think that reflects a misunderstanding of the nature of paradigms. Yeah, we can all take actions and that, that might contribute, but we can never bring about a paradigm shift. It's, it's a much larger organism than any one of us can control. Um, and so it's a collective phenomenon. It has its own trajectory, its own force, if you like, and its own sure. evolutionary dynamic. So there's very little that we can do except pay attention to it and then question our own belief systems in relationship to the cultural belief system and see what needs to change. Now, typically what happens is if we have a particular belief and the surrounding cultural belief system is different, most of the time, just through the, 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 the pressure of social, social pressure, we tend to close down our own particular belief system and just adopt the belief system of the culture. Now, occasionally we will have an experience that is so undeniable to us and yet so clearly contradicts the, the, the dominant paradigm that we won't just assume, oh, I must have misunderstood my own experience or I was just hallucinating. Say, no, no, that was a real experience, but the current paradigm has no way to explain that. And so when those kinds of events happen, instead of dismissing our own experience, we recognize the limitations of the current paradigm 
and may then do some work to just communicate more brightly, more, more widely and broadly that these experiences happen, but according to the current paradigm, they should be impossible. And I'll give an example of that would be telepathy, for example, when people have a telepathic communication, according to the standard scientific paradigm, that's just not possible. Because, and we get to this in a moment, um, because the standard dominant paradigm today in, in the Western world, particularly, is scientific materialism. And that particular belief system says that consciousness is nothing other than something produced by the brain. And 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 brains cannot communicate from one brain to another except through language either spoken language or written language or some kind of gesture there's no right. mind direct mind to mind communication according to the standard paradigm yet i'm going to assume that you've probably had anomalous experiences you've had telepathic i know i have frequently sure. most of the people if not everyone that i know has had and yet the dominant paradigm has no way to account for that. So that is point, and, and in general, the, the, this is um, one aspect of the growing interest in consciousness studies is because people recognize that the standard paradigm really hasn't a clue about consciousness. And yet it is the central phenomenon, the central event experience in everyone's life. And yet it remains completely um, unexplained within the current paradigm. Well, and I feel like to me that's that's a source of maybe a lot of people's stress and frustration in life is. Well, I guess at least from the materialist paradigm, because to me the materialist paradigm kind of takes the the hardcore materialist paradigm. Like I, I acknowledge the reality of matter. If I uh, step outside in the street, I'm going to get hit by a car, right? Um, but uh, just that being the only aspect to reality is, a, I don't want to say empty, but I, you know, I just don't find it to be a positive worldview that would inspire. Whereas, and whereas, uh, you know, something else that honors both the material and the consciousness that comes with it, uh, one, resonates more for me as true, but two, is a more, it feels like a more optimistic kind of thing, too. Um, you know, I'm putting my emotions in, uh, as labels on this, but uh, I don't know. Do you feel that way? Do you feel that there's like uh, the whole concept, really, that you introduced in Radical Nature, this idea of you know, there is a paradigm of material and consciousness being united. Um, do you feel that's a, an optimistic perspective? And can you expand upon just that concept as a whole a little bit more? For well, us? I will. Thank you. Yeah. Um, but rather than immediately go into talking about what I see as the benefits of that particular worldview where consciousness and the material are integrated, which is panpsychism is the technical term. I'll come back to that in a moment. Um, I think it might be useful if I just summarize the other three major worldviews and what they claim, then to show how panpsychism is a co coherent alternative and welcome alternative to those other three. So I'll begin yeah. with, with dualism, which essentially is the worldview, the philosophy that was that we've inherited from the French philosopher René Descartes. And he's famous for his famous phrase, I think, therefore I am. Um, we can come back to that statement if, if you like. It had a profound insight, but it also has some limitations. But his major achievement, if you like, and I might put that in inverted quotes, was to create what's now known as the mind-body problem and today more technically termed the hard problem, which is, according to Descartes, um, the material world is objective, and everything objective and material, physical, has some extension in space. Every object occupies some space, some volume of space. So he called that res extensa, extended things. That's the material world. 
In contrast to that, he said there's another domain of existence called res cogitans, it's basically thinking things. And he says thinking, and by thinking, he didn't just mean cognition, although there's some debate about that. It seems like he meant anything today that we might call mental, like feeling, desire, wishing, hoping, um, emotions. So none of these have extension. You will never find a thought in anybody's head. You will never find the size of, a, of an emotion and so on and so on. So Ray's cogitons, um, thinking things, have no extension in space. So the physical world has extension in space. The non-physical conscious world or mental world has no extension in space. And they exist in these separate domains. And they come together and somehow interact. Now, that somehow interact was the major problem that he never resolved. And in fact, nobody has resolved in the 400 years since he came up with that. Um, that if they are so radically different and they exist in completely separated domains, how could we ever explain how they come together or interact? That remains completely problematic today in dualism. So some other philosophers and scientists recognized the limitations of dualism and said, well, okay, dualism cannot explain mind-body interaction, so we need a different paradigm. We need a different worldview, a different understanding. And so the materialists try to simplify things by saying, well, let's just lop off half of reality, the mental side, the consciousness side, the psychic side, and declare that only objects that have extension in space that can be measured and mathematically analyzed are real. Now that's the extreme version. A less extreme version might not say only objects that occupy space are real, but they're the only ones we can have any scientific information about because they can be measured and mathematically analyzed. Um, that's the less extreme version of, of materialism. But in, in any version of materialism, there's no way to explain how anybody ever has any experience it can talk about if, yeah realism says that you know experience or consciousness is epi, ep, an epiphenomenon yeah, epi right? yes 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 yeah so that's one that's one aspect of it is again one of the, the the less extreme versions is to say that yeah the complexity of the brain it's, it's so complex but, you know some would claim it's the most complex system in the known universe and that might be true um, that the complexity of the interactions between the neurons and the synapses in the brain and the rest of the nervous system is so complex that at some point it squirts out consciousness. That's the all those, billiard, all those billiard balls swirling around and, and magically oof. magically produce an experience. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, and of course, if you Talk to your neuroscientist and, and say, mm, that's an interesting theory, but now I'd like you to just explain to me step by step how any purely physical set of events that occur, for example, in the brain and the neurons and the nervous system, how any purely physical set of events could ever produce anything non-physical, like consciousness, something that doesn't exist in space. How could any purely physical events ever produce something that would require a miracle. The idea that non-physical minds could emerge from purely physical brains is just as logically problematic for the materialists as interaction is for the dualists. No, just as no dualist can explain how mind and, and matter interact, according to dualism, no materialist can explain how purely physical brain events could ever produce non-physical minds or consciousness. They can't even begin to explain that. So just as dualism would require a miracle to be true, materialism would require a miracle to be true. Okay, so what do we do? Well, let's see what other, other alternatives exist out there. Well, then there's the mirror image of materialism, which is idealism, and this tends to be the the worldview adopted by most, uh, certainly many spiritual traditions, 
instead of saying that the fundamental nature of reality is purely physical stuff, as materialists claim, the idealists flipped that over and said, no, the fundamental nature of reality is pure consciousness. And what we call the physical world is either an emanation from pure consciousness or it's just an illusion. Well, if we claim that the material world is just an emanation from pure consciousness, then we're basically facing exactly the same problem that the materialists faced in trying to explain how you could get non-physical mind from purely physical brains. Now the question is, how can you get real physical matter from pure non-physical consciousness or minds or spirit, whatever it might be? Just as it's impossible to explain how you can get something non-physical from purely physical ingredients, it's equally impossible to explain how you can get something physical from purely non-physical ingredients. So the idea of emanationism in, material, in, in, in idealism is essentially just the mirror image and it hits exactly the same problems um, that materialists face in trying to explain. So in materialism, it's emergence, the emergence of mind from mindless matter. In idealism, it's the emanation of real matter from pure consciousness. None of those can be explained. Well, science and philosophy are in the business of providing coherent explanations. And so if dualism doesn't work, oh, I, there's, a, there's a second aspect of, of idealism I didn't get to, I'll come to that now. And I, materialism doesn't work and idealism doesn't work. What, what alternatives do we have? Well, there is a second form of idealism that I did mention, which is to say that, well, it, there is no emanation there is no real physical world emanating from pure consciousness. All there is, is pure consciousness. There is no physical world, it's just an illusion in consciousness that what we take to be the physical world are just events in consciousness, but there is no actual physical world. Now, what's interesting about that position is it doesn't run into the same logical problem that materialism and dualism and emanationism do, because there's no way to logically refute the fact that the physical world actually doesn't exist. And why is that? Because everything we know about the physical world, we know as an experience in consciousness. We know nothing about the physical world except what occurs in our unconsciousness. And so everything we know about the physical world is known in consciousness. Does that mean, therefore, the physical world doesn't really exist? Well, no, it doesn't. Because if you talk to anyone who claims that the physical world is just an illusion, just observe them, and very briefly, you will see that they contradict themselves in, in how they live their lives. Because, and I know many, many people who claim that the physical world is just an illusion, that they wear clothes, they live in houses, they eat food, they avoid poisons, they won't bump into cars on the freeway. They treat the physical world at every moment as though it's real, even while claiming it's unreal, because they have no other alternative. If we try to live in the world as though the physical world is unreal, we get badly bruised very quickly and probably don't last very long. We die off if we don't treat the physical world as real. So we have to, we don't have any choice about accepting the physical world as real. Even the people who claim that it's an illusion continue and consistently live as though it's real. So that's called a performative contradiction. Their performance in the world contradicts what they claim about the nature of the world. And philosophers are trained to, anytime you come up against a performative contradiction, it's kind of like a red flag that says, something here needs further investigation. Something's not quite right here. And so, what I discovered in the philosophy of the um, American, British American philosopher, Alfred North Whitehead, is the philosophy mm -hmm. called panpsychism, which is the fourth alternative to idealism, materialism, and dualism. Now, panpsychism claims, as does dualism, that both mind and matter are fundamentally real. But unlike dualism, it doesn't say they are separate. Mind and matter are inseparable that wherever you have matter, an object that occupies space, that piece of matter has its own experience, has its own ability to feel the world around it. It is sentient matter, it is sentient energy. Matter, of course, is condensed energy. 
And so in panpsychism, the ultimate nature of reality is sentient energy. It's energy as the physicists claim, but it's not dead energy as they assume it is. No, it's energy that tingles with the spark of experience, that tingles with the spark of spirit, if you like, that there is no embodiment without feeling or experience. And there's no consciousness without embodiment. They always go together. You never have free floating consciousness. It's always embodied in some form of embodiment. That's the panpsychic well, view. That that's really interesting because you know I think uh, people think that oh if we just keep uh, drilling down further into materiality we'll figure out uh, consciousness. But what you're saying is that you could drill all the way down to the atom, what the subatomic, and there's there's conscious. They're always intertwined. There's no level up or down of magnification where matter and consciousness aren't interrelated as uh, in relationship at least yeah exactly because if we approach that um just think it through rationally we recognize the problems facing um emergence in materialism and emanation in idealism that any worldview that claims you get one from the other, you get either mind from matter or matter from mind, um, is inexplicable. There's absolutely no way that would involve what's called an ontological jump, mm -hmm. that you begin with reality in state A, purely physical, and then it gets more complex. And eventually, now reality is in state B, where you have physical and non-physical. But how could something, and this is what I mentioned earlier, how could something purely physical ever produce anything non-physical? That would require an impossible, at least inexplicable, ontological jump. There's no way to explain how reality could make that shift. And so the idea of getting one from the other is a non-starter. That problem doesn't arise in um, panpsychism, where one of the slogans is consciousness all the way down. So even at the level of a cell, at the level of a molecule, at the level of an atom, at the subatomic level of electrons and protons and photons, there is some experience, there is consciousness happening at that level. Is it the same as human consciousness? No, why would we assume it would be? Of course it's not. But we are made up of that. We are made up of atoms and we have consciousness. How do we account for that? Clearly not because of what's going on in our purely physical brains, according to materialism. Well, the only way that we can explain that we have consciousness and we are made of atoms is that if the atoms themselves have their own consciousness, or we can move it up the scale and say, our cells have, we are made of cells and, and we have consciousness, therefore the cells must have consciousness because you cannot get something from nothing. If there was right. no consciousness at the level of the cells, then there would be no consciousness at the level of the organism. If there's no consciousness at the level of the molecules, there will be no consciousness at the level of the cells. If there's no consciousness at the level of the atoms, there will be no consciousness at the level of the molecules, and so on and so on. There's no consciousness cut anywhere along the line. If there was, then we would encounter exactly the same problem of what we call now the, the hard problem, the mind the mind um, mind body problem of how can we explain how they relate to each other so the only coherent assumption and yes of course it is an assumption but it's a logical assumption is that consciousness goes all the way down there is no level of physical reality where there isn't some experience happening now of course the experience of an atom is going to be very very different from the experience of a dolphin or a dog or a human being of course that's going to be the case but it doesn't mean it's zero experience it just is pr it's primitive experience that then as matter evolves the consciousness associated with that becomes more complex and more evolved and so yeah but the system evolves it, it, it can be capable of more experience because of that complexity like it's always got some capability there because it's made of matter and, and consciousness and is always tied to matter so but as you scale up, scale down, the maybe awareness or level of consciousness scales oh, yeah, up. I mean, that's, 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 too, is that... yeah. So so at the at the higher complex levels, um, like in a an animal body, mm -hmm. the complexity of the matter 
means the experience of the consciousness that goes along with that matter has more options open to it to experience. So an organism made of countless billions of cells or atoms is clearly going to have at least the potential to have a whole host of experiences that a single atom could never have. A single atom cannot experience what it's like to be a complex system, as complex as a, as a, a brain or an organism. So, so yes, there are different levels of consciousness as the material world becomes more and more evolved and more complex, its inherent consciousness likewise evolves, becomes more and more complex. And so, yeah, we as, as and, you know, our senses evolve and we can pick up different aspects of the physical world through our senses and then they feed into our experience that, um, that differ from species to species. Now, of course, um, most of our consciousness is these days um, assumed to be sensory experience. And probably for most of, for the most part, it is sensory experiences. But that doesn't mean that every experience needs to come through the senses. Single cells don't have sight or sound or, or ears or they, they don't have the five senses that we have. And of course, atoms and molecules and so on don't either. So it's a very different kind of experience, but it's still experience. And what do we mean by experience? Well, Whitehead called it prehension. It's the ability to take into account something other than oneself. That's what experience is. It's prehending or apprehending. He called it prehension. It's prehending the world around us, being aware of the world around us. And every single entity that exists has the ability to experience its position in its environment and then to sense the possibilities in that environment and then to make choices based on its awareness of those possibilities. And that's how... Um, consciousness works through being aware of possibilities and then making choices to, if you like, collapse a spectrum of possibilities into the next moment of an actual event. Very profound. Now, this this whole um, concept that we're talking about here makes me feel like it's also implying that there's a fundamental unity between all of us. If consciousness and matter are together and we are all you know when i say all i mean i guess everything in physical reality made of the same stuff you know uh does that mean we're all like the same consciousness too but just experiencing itself in different ways well um there are different different um perspectives or theories on that. You know, some people say it's all just one consciousness. That might be true, but does, th does that tell us anything more than saying it's all just one matter? I mean, we all share, we're all made of atomic matter. Yeah. But there aren't any antimatter organisms in our neck of the woods. So every, everything that exists in our environment is made up of the same stuff, physical stuff that we are. And so, so if there's, it doesn't make sense to say we are all one matter. That kind of sounds strange to say that. Yeah, we are all made of the same stuff. Um, yeah, I guess it doesn't seem that profound when, I, you know, I used, it used to really move me when I think of like uh, Carl Sagan saying we're all stardust. And, I, you know, I yeah. guess that's meaningful to me that we're all interrelated, but it also is kind of hollow, hollow intellectually, at least, just to say we're all one matter or something like that. That doesn't, yeah. yeah well, yeah. But, can you do, see, this can is you do with that information. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. No, I love that because, and, and honestly, this is part of the reason I I love our interactions because uh, you are like keeping me honest always, and uh, like that's that's what makes for uh, I think good conversation and, and pushing understanding ahead too. Because you know I can just say things and then. You know, you're like, hey, let me let me pull you back in here for a second, and uh, yes. let's revisit that. So, thank you. I pr I appreciate that, and yeah. um, I, that's good in, in conversation that we can check each other. Um, sorry, I totally got us off offline with that, but um, no, 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 that's good. So basically, yeah, you, you you asked a really good question. Like, is are we all one consciousness? And I, that just triggered me to flip it a little bit and say, well, 
what do we really mean by asking that question? And how is that any right. different from saying, are we all one matter? Um, to me, a more interesting question is not so much are we all one? Because clearly, if that's true, we're also multiple as well. I am not yeah. you and you are not me. You know, mm -hmm. if I get hungry, I don't try to feed your mouth. I feed <laughs> my mouth. <laughs> right, right, right. So individuality is a reality we have to take account of. However, and so most of what we've been talking about up until this point is the content of my first book, Radical Nature. And now I'm going yeah. to shift a little bit to the second one, Radical Knowing. Awesome. And um, so oh, I've just lost my train of thought. Um, We're shifting over to ra Radical Knowing. Yeah, no, that, that, yeah but, but where was I in the conversation that made me think that? Um, oh, I've lost it. Let's, let's just carry on the conversation. If we can. no, that's all right. No, we, we were just kind of recapping the uh, all one thing, and then um, yeah, so said how we really just dove oh, into you, ideas. I, I knew, I knew, I knew it would come back to me. Um, yeah. So the really interesting question isn't are we all one or are we you know are we individuals? And so the relationship to to radical knowing is that yes, we are individuals. We are independent, but that's not our deepest nature. Our deepest nature isn't our isolated subjectivity, it's our intersubjectivity. While it's true to say that when I feel hungry, I won't try to feed your mouth or anybody else's, I will feed myself because I'm aware of my own individuality. As a philosopher, or if, if you like, through shamanic experiences or mystical experiences, I'm also aware that who I am is constituted by my relationship with you, by my relationship with every other sentient being, in fact. Even if I'm not aware of that, that we are constantly, intersubjectively co-creating each other throughout the entire cosmos. That, to me, is, is the fundamental nature of, 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 of reality, is that we are intersubjective beings. We are co-creating each other at every moment. That doesn't deny our individuality, but it says that our individuality is not our fundamental nature. Our fundamental nature is our shared co-created reality, our intersubjective reality. And the image I often use is picture reality as this ocean, this intersubjective ocean where all beings are co-creating each other. And then on this ocean, from time to time, individual waves will arise. That's us. These are the individuals. But the wave is not the deepest nature of the ocean. The ocean itself is its own deepest nature. And so our individuality, while it's real, waves on the ocean are real, but they are not the ultimate reality of the ocean. And our individuality is real, but it's not the ultimate reality of us. Our ultimate reality is our intersubjective connectivity with everybody else. And so that's really the topic of um, the second book, Radical Knowing. And, and would you say that as we kind of emerge from that ocean, if I'm going to extend that concept a little mm -hmm. further, that it's an emerging, but it's a, an emerging of, of systems? Like I remember from class, like we had this concept of the human being is not an object, but a process. Um, can you can you help flush that idea out a little bit in this context like um all right we are there's a there's an, a fundamental ocean right and we are a wave that pops up um can you talk about like how that relates to i guess systems theory and how like all right for example uh, you're talking about the interplay like in order for me to be here the planets had to be here, formulate for all these years. The sun's rays have to hit. My parents had to meet. Like, there's an interplay of all yeah. these things going on that lead up, at least my particular wave. And then, you know, uh, you could say that of all the other waves that um, come into being. Am I off course? No, no, no. I think you're very right. Um, you're, you're exactly just teasing out some of the implications of the of the metaphor of the ocean that I used. And of course, like all metaphors and analogies, it has its limitations. But by stretching it the way that you just have, I think is is insightful because what it points to is 
every wave that exists in the ocean is a response to what's happening to all the other waves throughout the entire ocean. So it is a system. No wave exists entirely independent of all the other waves. What happens in the wave over here is like the butterfly effect is going to have some effect on the wave over here. So we are all interconnected, which brings me back to another point that I wanted to make. <clears throat> you know, for a long time, one of the slogans, favorites, famous slogans was everything is interconnected. And um, you know, a, lot, a lot of people hear that and they, they like the sound of that. Well, I was some years ago preparing to give a talk on, on, on this very topic of interconnectedness. And I was, I don't know about you, but I get my aha insights in two major places, either while I'm driving in my car or when I'm in the shower. All right. on this particular occasion, I was in the shower and <clears throat> I was thinking about interconnectedness and you know, is everything interconnected? And then I just had this, of course, of course everything is interconnected. There's no other possibility. Here's, what I, here's how I arrived at that. Let's say you have two or more objects. Mm -hmm. We can even leave consciousness out of it at this point. It doesn't matter whether consciousness is involved or not. So we've got two objects. Are they separated? Well, if they're separated, it means there's something between them that's separating them, right? Well, whatever is between them, in this case, air, that's separating them, also connects them. Whatever yeah. separates them connects them. There's no other possibility. And if there's nothing between them, then they're together, which means they're not separate. And they're, yeah, wow, yeah. So, so don't... Whatever way you look at it, of course everything is interconnected. It's impossible for anything to be separate. We live in a universe. <laughs> you can't you can't sleep on the negative space. It's all, yeah, it's all touching. It, wow. And so then I realized the interesting question isn't, is everything interconnected? Because obviously the answer is yes. The real interesting question is, how are things interconnected? How are things related? What's the quality of the relationship between one human being and another human being, between human beings as a society and the environment? What's the quality and nature of our connectedness? That's what's important. Are we connected through physical connections only? Or are we connected psychically through consciousness, intersubjectively? And so that's what the book Radical Knowing explores, is the nature of our interconnectedness not are we interconnected that's a given but what is the and then what are the consequences of different kinds of being related is um, in, in in that book in radical knowing i have a chapter on what i call pre-conquest and post-conquest consciousness where the pre-conquest conquest refers to the um the the, the, the uh, conquistadors coming over from europe to the americas and and dominating the indigenous peoples here. So the indigenous peoples had what this Stanford anthropologist called pre-conquest consciousness. That kind of consciousness is based on feeling, on feeling the relationships to their community. And for them, what matters, for them, truth, is not something objective. Truth is what emerges from their collective, from their tribe, from their community, which is very different from the kind of truth, unquotes, in quotes, that was brought over from Europe, um, where it was forced on the indigenous peoples. Um, and of course, a major difference between the what I call indigenous pre-conquest mindset and the industrial post-conscious, post-conquest consciousness is that one is feeling-based and the other is logic-based. The post-conquest Western mode of consciousness is based in reason and logic and in dialectic, that somebody will come up with an idea, a thesis, and then somebody will count, counteract that or contradict it with an antithesis, 
And the assumption or hope is that through the conflict of a thesis and an antithesis, a new synthesis will arrive that will be an advance in knowledge. That's the standard Western assumption. That's yeah. the dialectical approach. In the indigenous communities, it's not just in the Americas, this is transglobal, it's much more feeling-based. It's not about winning an argument. It's about how, in my interaction with you, am I going to make us as a community feel better? How are we going to enhance our feeling of being a community? For them, that's what matters, not winning an argument. So it's the difference between dialogue, where they're focused on speaking from their feelings, and dialectic, which is to try and win an argument. So one, the, pre, the post conquest dialectic is motivated by domination, whereas the pre conquest mode of consciousness is dominated by empathy, by feeling. Now, what's interesting, what the uh, Stanford anthropologist um, E. Richard Sorensen pointed out is that when you have a clash between these two different modes of consciousness, the pre-conquest Western industrial, the post-conquest Western industrial and the pre-conquest indigenous, because the indigenous mode wants you to feel good, wants, doesn't want to win over an argument, it just wants to have a dialogue in a way that enriches your experience. So if it encounters somebody with a dialectical argumentative approach that wants to dominate, what, what's the, almost the inevitable result? is the conquest will dominate because the indigenous says, well, it's obviously important to you to win an argument and I want you to feel good. I'm not going to argue with you. And so through history, the Western industrial mindset has dominated the pre-conquest -con pre indigenous mindset. And so now we have these clash of paradigms, major dominant paradigms of um, modes of consciousness. Um, it's a real shame, you know, it it seems that uh, that trajectory is really a uh, Dunnison kind of to an extent. Um, not to be doom and gloom about it, but I think, you, you know, you and I both know what's going on out there. A actually, this might be a good time to re bring up uh, your friend Peter Russell we were chatting about before we started recording. Um, <clears throat> would you have any interest in explaining to us just, you know, his new work and what you've been talking about oh uh, sure um, yeah, as it relates yeah. to the climate yeah um, i feel like this is kind of connected to the okay yeah i can give you a summary of his work and like i recommended earlier on in our um pre-recording interview that um i think he would be a very good candidate for you to interview as well and no doubt he'll go into a lot more detail than i would but essentially his thesis is this um, well, I begin by saying he has a new book out called Forgiving Humanity, and it's about climate change. And he's basically saying that, yes, we are headed for catastrophe globally as a species, as a civilization. But we can't blame the industrialists. We can't blame the oil companies. We can't blame the governments and so on and so on. There really is nobody to blame. And he says the reason for that is, is it's inevitable. What's happening is inevitable. Given a species that has intelligence and the ability to manipulate its environment, it will naturally want to do anything it can to just make life more comfortable. It will, through you know, building a chair, building a wheel, whatever it is, creating a mattress, they'll make life more comfortable. So every innovation will encourage further innovation. And so it starts off very slowly, but because innovation creates opportunities for new innovation, it gradually picks up speed. And then over the centuries and millennia, innovation begins to accelerate to the point where it is today, now in the 21st century, that it's running out of control. It's an exponential acceleration. And any system, like our ecological system, that can be graphed with an exponential curve is a description of a system that's just about to collapse. It's unsustainable. It will collapse. And so innovation, we are an innovative species. We have the ability to innovate by changing our environment. 
And that just has run away from us to the point where there's not no action we can take to stop that. So, so Russell might argue, you know, as we were just talking about, you know, uh, the post uh, colonial, you know, the dominator mindset that was brought <laughs> over from the West to, you know, the indigenous. Um, so he would, he would almost put that aside and say, you know, or, or maybe that that's a symptom of our use of, of tools and stuff that, you know, those mindsets are part of the, go along with our evolution of use of tools. Like, do you see what I'm saying here? Like, so you, you, you brought up like, uh, that we're on this trajectory, at least from uh, Peter Russell's perspective of uh, collapse, because it's just natural. It's just natural because we can shape our environment. Yeah, yeah. I'm just, I'm just wondering how you think that relates to like the, because for me, I've always thought of, oh, we're on this slippery slope because we just consume, 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 take, don't give back, don't think about yeah, symbiosis yeah. or balance with our interactions with the environment yeah yeah so yeah. I, I don't i don't know so really Peter interesting Russell has a very interesting, i'm sorry go ahead finish oh yeah i, I was just commenting like I, i'm sorry i'm just kind of spit thinking out loud but yeah it's a really interesting perspective that it puts forth how the you know our ability to shape the environment alone is like the big driving force here well, it is. Now, what's interesting, too, um, and I'm, I'm not sure if he talks about that in his book. I think he does, but I know I've, I've had conversations with him in person about this, that, um, you know, people will say, well, all we need to do is to give up our industrial way of life and return to the indigenous way of life. And he points out, you know, that, you know, that, that's, that's a nice sentiment. He says, but that's not going to solve the problem. It's just going to extend the timeline. He says, mm. indigenous communities aren't immune to innovation either. It's just that they innovate at a much, much slower pace than the industrial communities do. And so, yes, they, they live in much greater harmony with their environment, but they are an intelligent species that can manipulate the environment, and they do that they do so in very minimal ways and slow ways, but eventually because innovation leads to more innovation. And remember that today's industrial communities in Europe and in the, in the Americas and elsewhere in the world were once indigenous communities. The people in Europe were once indigenous peoples. So there's always a progression and it's just a matter of how fast that exactly. progression happens. Exactly, yeah, the, 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 if you like, it's, I was going to say a law of nature, but I, pr I prefer to use Whitehead's terminology, which is a habit of nature. And the habit of nature is that innovation leads to further innovation. And as that process continues, it will accelerate. And eventually, as, as acceleration accelerates even more, it becomes exponential. And then very soon after that, the system collapses. It spins out of control. That any system that is where the um, the speed of innovation is greater than the ability of the system to adapt to the innovations will collapse, and that's we see that happening. I mean, that's what's that's what global climate change is all about. Yeah, I would say it's ha happening. Uh... On a number of fronts in the world well, today, is, for yeah. sure. I guess, I guess, selfishly, I want to slow it down. I, you know, like Me I, I no. yeah, yeah. I think we should slow it down and get creative and expressive and be more empathetic and kind while we're slowing it down. Like I, that's, I don't know. To me, that's what this whole party is about. I'm, I'm, you know, I'm 34, and I feel like that's what I'm starting to just kind of understand is like, hey you could sprint to the finish as an individual or we can as a collective, but maybe there's a more artful and fun and yeah, you know, yeah. kind way we can, we can still. Yeah. Well, um, so I, I know we're, go ahead. Sorry. I want to, I want you to get your thought out for sure. 
Uh, okay, um, let's see if I can make it brief. Um, again, I've just lost I, that that um, that vaccine is making my mind go a little foggy, so I'm not thinking as clearly as I would like to. So I've forgotten what it's I was okay. about. And I, I, I jumped in and, and stopped your train of thought too. So if it comes back, let me know. But I was wondering I maybe, yeah. like, um, you know, we, we've been talking for an hour and I want to respect your time, but I also was hoping maybe we could, before we, you know, wrap and uh, talk a little bit about Deep Spirit, the Noetic Code. Um, okay. I, I know that's kind of a hard pivot and I, I've just kind of... Uh, abruptly turned us that direction but um you know that book was so profound for me because um it it's it's close enough to real in the sense of hey there could be this communication with a non-human intelligence like a dolphin that could really have a meaningful impact on my life and I don't know like the book was just so fun and adventurous and I think that it's also helped me with you know uh the the, 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 the non-human intelligence topic is also very popular right now with uh the guy David Grush who testified to Congress about UFOs and whether it's a true or not it just made me think about well if aliens were here how would I interact with them so you know, I'm Maybe mm -hmm. could you explain for everybody what the book's a little bit about? I know it's not about aliens, but it's about uh, dolphins. And, um, so I appreciate you tolerating my weirdness and comparing the two. But um, I, I just think it's cool and, and it offers people another perspective of a lot of things, actually. Thank you. Um, well, yeah, I, I can situate the book Deep Spirit within the context of, of my um, collective books in general. So most of my writings are what I would call nonfiction, um, radical knowing, radical nature, consciousness from zombies to angels, blind spots, and so on. Now I'm aware that you know, as a philosopher, and I, I like to you know get into the nitty gritty and and be as coherent and and as deep as I as I can be, but also to use the training I had as a journalist to try and communicate profound ideas in ways that without sacrificing the integrity of the ideas can communicate to people, doesn't just confuse them with jargon, technical jargon. So that's what I attempted to do in, in my nonfiction books. But I re realized after a few years that even though I attempted to do that, my readership was still pretty selective. You know, a lot of people just weren't interested in diving that deep into, into conceptual um, perspectives. And so I thought, well, I'd like the, I think there are important ideas here. I'd like to get them out to a wider audience. And so I thought, well, one way to do that is to try and express the same ideas for my other books, but wrap them up in a narrative, in, as in a fictional story, um, without, again, without sacrificing the integrity of the ideas that the characters in the story are portraying. And so Deep Spirit is essentially, there are three main characters. There is a NASA scientist <clears throat> um, whose project is exploring for extraterrestrial life in the cosmos. That's, he's part of, the, of NASA and the SETI um, group looking for ex signs of extraterrestrial life. And, and he loves his work, he's, he's passionate about it but he's not making a lot of progress. And um, his boss says, well, you know, I've just been at a conference where I met a, a young woman who is an, a doctoral student, an anthropology doctoral student, and she's um, working on interspecies communication between humans and dolphins at the University of Hawaii. And um, I think you should arrange to meet her. And because what she is learning in her efforts to communicate with a dolphin may very well be helpful to you if and whenever you discover alien life beyond the earth and you want to communicate with them. So there may be something of value for you to learn there. So he, long story short, he arranges to meet her 
they meet and then she introduces him to her dolphin friend and the dolphin is called Darwin. Um, and of course, they are there as um, humans assuming to be the superior species. They're there thinking they're going to train this dolphin to speak English and maybe they can communicate. After a while, they realize that ah, something else is going on here. And they realize that the dolphin is actually way more intelligent than they are, and he's training them because he wants to get released. He doesn't like being caught up in an aquarium as a as a, a, a subject for scientific study. He wants to get back in, in, into the ocean and swim with his. So he's training them to release him, but but also at the same time he wants to give them some valuable. Info. So that's the, the the thesis of the of of the, the novel, and then. Of course, the conversations between them will deal with things like, um, what is the nature of reality? Is, does the brain produce the mind and so on? Um, and, and then it's built up around a, you know, a narrative that involves adventure along the way. And so to try yeah. and make the ideas more palatable and engaging. So that's in a, in a nutshell what Deep Spirit is about. Well, yeah, and it is, and I'm, I thank you for explaining it to everybody. I'm sorry, I'm sorry, I'm sorry, I'm sorry to interrupt. What well, one other important aspect of Deep Spirit? Oh, yeah. that I've got so so that's one aspect. The other is that as he's searching for signs of extraterrestrial intelligence, extraterrestrial life, Darwin the dolphin points out to him that maybe you're looking for alien intelligence in the wrong place. You're looking for it out there in the cosmos. Maybe the alien intelligence that you need to connect with exists within you. You are isolated from your own deep feeling. You've been so trained as a NASA scientist and as a mathematician that you've lost touch with your empathy, with your emotional aspect of your life. Maybe you need to connect with that. That's the alien intelligence that you need to. So that's another aspect of the story. And of course, it then he goes through various crises as he deals with um, different levels of awakening and realization. Well, I feel like that is the ultimate crisis for a lot of us in some ways, or at least for a lot of years in life is uh, not knowing the alien that is our ourself and our yeah. internal yeah. Yeah. life. Well, yeah. Thank, thanks for explaining the book, though, because I, I think it makes these concepts, which can be a little heady for people, but I know a lot of people are really interested in them, and I think it just makes it so accessible. And it is an adventure, too. Like, it's a page-turner, and I know it's been out for you know a while now, but it's it's one that's as relevant as ever um, for a lot of people. So I encourage everyone to go check it out. It's super fun almost maybe even start there and if you like the concepts you know as dr de quincey puts them out in the noetic code then go into radical nature go into radical knowing and then dig you know even deeper into those things i think this is almost like a great primer for for a, a deeper dive into your other books i agree yeah 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 Awesome. Well, hey, I mean, I feel like we're kind of coming to a, an organic end here, and I want to be respectful of your time, but I, I want to ask one thing. Is there anything we haven't covered today that you think would be valuable to get out to people? Because you, you know, I, I came into this with my kind of ideas of, oh, I know Dr. Quincy is, a, you know, great thoughts about this and that, but what's, you know, what's stirring inside you? What's a message you feel like people need to know, or what's just a topic that you know, it would you'd think would be good for people to bring into focus these days. Okay. <clears throat> mm. I've debating, I've been debating before we even started this call and during this call whether or not I should address what I'm about to address, um, which is the cutting edge of where I am in my intellectual development. As you know, as we talked about, I've a major part of my work as discussed in Radical Nature, is exploring the different worldviews that attempt to explain the relationship between mind and body, energy and consciousness. And, and so I wrote my books with as much integrity and precision and um, 
and coherence as I possibly could. And for a long time, really thought I was getting very close to the truth. And ironically, <clears throat> one of the philosophies of, of the Western canon that I've critiqued pretty severely in radical nature is what is, is the philosophy known as postmodernism. Um, that's usually characterized as there are no absolutes, everything is relative and, and so on. And so I, I, I used to think that that was such a simplistic, um, almost blind approach to understanding reality and knowledge. Until I began some years ago to read a book called Philosophy and the Mirror of Nature by a philosopher called Richard Rorty, who basically was basing his book on the work of Wittgenstein, mostly Wittgenstein, but, but some other pragmatists like Dewey and Heidegger. Um, essentially, his thesis was, he was summarizing the thesis, it's just the whole mind-body problem, the whole idea in the Western tradition of the mind is based on a misunderstanding. It's based on an ocular, a metaphor of the, 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 the inner eye, that, that, the, that we have this inner eye that can look inward to see what's going on in our minds. And he says, we've since Descartes, and even before Descartes, but certainly after Descartes, that has been taken almost without question as the reality that, of course, we have this inner experience, we have this inner mind. Now, what Wittgenstein pointed out, he says, yeah, we believe that because that's the language game that we've been accustomed to using. He says, but if we shift the language game and, and, and you, instead of using visual metaphors like the seeing eye um, and just talk about maybe language, we recognize that the search for truth I'm, I'm, it's, I'm trying to summarize very briefly a very long argument here, but basically they're saying that the search for truth is a fool's game. There's no way to ever know if we have arrived at the truth. Because why is that? Because every expression of truth requires language, but every language occurs within a particular social context. So we all speak and write and interact within what Wittgenstein called a language game. Now, a language game isn't just, you know, the difference between French and English or Chinese or Indonesian or whatever it might be. No, language games are the different rules and conventions that a community unconsciously uses when it communicates with its fellow beings. Most of the time, we're not aware, you know, the, the grammatical rules, but other rules as well, not just grammar. And we, these are in the background, we're unaware of them. And we just take that to be the reality. And so one group will use its particular language game to arrive at, oh, okay, so that's the truth. Another community over here will have a different language game, a different set of rules and assumptions, and will arrive at a different conclusion at a different truth. So who's right? Wittgenstein points out that there's no way to ever adjudicate that. There's no meta language that we can appeal to, to evaluate language game over here and language game over here. There's no way for us to evaluate them. And all we have are these competing games. And, and, and so they, they can argue with each other. But that's a little bit like somebody playing chess, arguing over the rules of basketball. Yeah, yeah. And that's why yeah. there's so much incompatibility and breakdown in communication when people are searching for truth. And so, and most of my work as a philosopher has been part of that tradition. And so what's happened for me over the last couple of years is a major shift. I've been through what I call an epistemological crisis. At first, it was very disturbing. I thought, well, oh my God, every, I've spent my whole career trying to get at the truth. And now I realize I've basically wasted my time, that there is no truth that I can ever get at. So all my books and lectures and so on have been a waste of time. I mean, this was my concern. But then gradually yeah. I realized, but hold on a minute. That's also true of every other philosopher who's ever written a book. It's just their perspective. This is my perspective. I'm not saying it's the truth. 
But this, based on what I have learned from reading and research and experience and meditation and contemplation, this is how I see reality. I'm not claiming it's the truth. I'm saying that this is what works for me in understanding the world. So that's, that's the cutting edge that I'm on at the moment. I am no longer a searcher after truth. I am, if you like, a, a, a participant in the game of trying to enhance the experience of life. Wow. Wow, I love that. Um, I hope that can be the case for all of us, right? Like, I don't know, I'm so guilty of it. And even to this day, and I'm sure everybody that knows me can say, oh, you just want to, you know, know everything, right? And um, there's a, there's a, there's a, uh, a sense of inadequacy by just trying to chase knowing everything. Like, it's like, you're almost saying that the present moment and your relationships that are right here in front of you aren't good enough, and you've got to go figure it out. But what you're saying with this view is like, whoa, 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 just get rid of that stuff and start getting, you know, into experience and relationship and just like feel almost. Yeah, and yeah, yeah. yeah. If, if, the, the one word that kept coming up in, in Rick Rorty's book, Philosophy in the Mirror of Nature, that I hadn't encountered in, you know, the, my whole career has been as a philosopher, so I've read countless books on philosophy, but the one word that stood out for me was conversation. So he says that, um, no, I'll, I'll step back a bit. I um, communicated this to uh, some students about a year ago and um, about how the search for truth is, a fool's game. We're never going to achieve it. And so this particular student said, well, and what's the point? Why don't I just give up? Why am I even in your class? You know, if, if, if we're not going to get the truth. And then I realized that the answer to that question, and I, understood, I understood where he was coming from, because you can have that kind of nihilistic give up, giving up um, approach. But what Rorty points out is that, no, you don't give up. Just because you can't reach truth doesn't mean you give up having a conversation. It means you continue having the conversation without the motivation of the illusion that is going to arrive at some truth. No, it doesn't. It just enhances our experience of being communicative beings. And we may learn something through the process. It's a pragmatic approach. It's not a, an approach to try and establish truth. It's what what makes life work better? That's essentially the different approach. It's uh, it's not trying to arrive at some end game. It's trying, it's enjoying the pr like process. It exactly. reminds me of I, I loved uh, Alan Watts was one of the first people before I started to get trying to pursue like formal uh, education. Um, who said? I think he said he's like uh, like life's a dance. He's like the best composers aren't the ones who. Uh, play really fast and get you to the end of the song the fastest it's more like it, it, you're, you're supposed to dance to the music while it's playing and enjoy it and not you know rush right in on it to the end yeah 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 mm -hmm. cool stuff well hey i mean i don't know is this a good place to wrap for you is there well, anything is, else I just that... with, with just one last idea one last phrase is it kind of wraps up literally wraps up what i've just been talking about and so yeah. so i would say that I've, in, a way, in a sense come full circle because in my first book in radical nature i wrote about how one of the things that really struck me about plato was on his deathbed he gathered his students around him and he said despite everything that i have taught you and all the books that i have written the one thing i want you to remember when i'm gone is this it's all just a likely story. It's not the truth. What's the most likely? What's the most probable account of the way things are? That's the best we can do. Yeah. You know? Yeah. No, that, that resonates so much. What else could we do? Like, I'm so weary of anyone who claims absolute truth, and I feel like you should be for forever, uh, to be honest. So that's yeah wow <laughs> on it what a way to go out right just a, a a message that literally has rung through eternity 
So thank you, Plato. Cool. Yeah, yes, thank you. We are still learning so much from you. Um, hey, I, I, I'm, I'm going to close this out and uh, I'll pause the recording, but, you know, don't go anywhere. I didn't want to give you a proper goodbye, but just, you know, close this out for the episode here. I want to say thank you so much for sharing your time, your wisdom, uh, you know, helping bring these ideas out into the uh, a, a broader audience and and make them maybe a little bit more sticky in the collective consciousness i think that um there's no better way to start this series with you helping us understand what paradigms are and you know as this thing goes on you know we'll get introduced to more and more but you've helped everybody out there build a good foundation um so I, I, I want to say it's been a, a pure honor to have you on here. I really appreciate all our connection and not just this today, but um, yeah, one final thanks for being the, the OG paradigm Sherpa, it, at, at least in, in my, from my perspective. <laughs> well, thank you. I can now add another, um, right. another uh, item to my CV, um, not just a, an author and philosopher and teacher, but I'm a paradigm sherper. I like that. Yes, well, well earned for sure. Thank you. Mm -hmm.